Hi there. We've been talking about being a part of God, God's body, friendships, how to be part of what God is doing. And today I want to talk about being a part of a team within God's church. Now, if you are looking into Christianity, you may be new to Christianity, you may be on the outside, this may surprise you that there are different layers or levels within the church. You may think, I just attend the church, I watch what's going on, and I leave, and that is church. But actually, there are different layers of involvement. And the core layer, the very deepest level of commitment, the Bible talks about being a fellow worker in a small team to achieve a task. So there are visitors to church or attenders who watch from the outside. There are those who get stuck in and they say, this is my church and they really are committed. But then there's another layer of commitment, which is called in the Bible being a fellow worker. The Greek word is synergos or synergos, where we get our word synergy from. Do you know what synergy means? It means when you take two things and the sum of them together is greater than the sum of their individual parts. So one plus one doesn't equal two with synergy. One plus one equals three or four because there's a multiplication effect. And the Bible talks about teams of people, fellow workers, synergos. The New Testament in the New King James Version translates that word synergos as fellow workers or fellow laborers. In other versions of the Bible, they may use a different word, but it's that Greek word and it means committed to each other in a team and it produces synergy. It produces a greater effect. A couple of little illustrative verses that help us understand this. Uh, the one is in Matthew 11. Jesus said, come to me and take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He said, if you're weary and heavy laden, come and take my yoke. And so there's this idea of being yoked together with Jesus and with other people. A yoke was a piece of wood that they would put over oxen to pull a cart. And it means we're yoked together. We're committed to each other, to a task to Jesus our leader, and we're a small team yoked together. And so when you see the word yoked in the New Testament, it's talking about that kind of a commitment where I know who my team members are. We're yoked, we're committed to each other. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, do not be yoked with unbelievers because you don't have the same common spiritual life within you. You don't have that light and that life within you. So we, we yoked with other believers and Paul would talk to his fellow workers sometimes in terms of this yoke language. So that's the one illustration of a team of fellow workers. The other is in Matthew chapter 10 where Jesus is speaking and he says, He who receives you receives me. He who receives me receives him who sent me. So Jesus is saying, if you are working for me, then the person who receives you or who becomes a friend of yours and, and accepts what you're saying and what you're doing on my behalf, they're not just receiving you, they're receiving me, Jesus, and the Father. There's, there's the synergy effect. But then he goes on to say, he who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. I not only get my own reward for my own works, but I get their reward as well because there's a synergy. He goes on to say, he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, assuredly I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. So it's not just me relating to great leaders like prophets and, and apostles. But it's also me relating to a little child and giving them something. It's giving, receiving, but being yoked together in teams. And there is a synergy. Paul had this relationship with the Philippian church. In Philippians 1, he says, I thank God for your partnership or fellowship in the gospel. Partnership. We're, we're linked together in the gospel. And he says, you are recipients with me of my grace. 
the word my is there in the Greek and it's in the King James, but in some translations, they leave out the word my. They say, you are recipients with me of grace. But it's actually there in the text. He says, you are recipients of my grace. They were sharing in Paul's grace. Paul was sharing in their grace. They were partners in the gospel. And later in Philippians chapter 4, he says, and my God will supply your needs according to his riches and glory. So my first point is there are teams and there is a synergy in the New Testament. But let's look at a few examples of these teams. In Romans, Paul is writing greetings. You know, there's these lists of names at the end of many of Paul's letters, and we often skip over them because we just get dazzled by so many names and we don't think about it. But it's beautiful to think about some of these names. He starts by saying, I commend to you Phoebe, our sister who is a servant or minister or deacon of the church in Kentria. So he starts by saying, there's this lady, Phoebe, I'm sending her to you, receive her, she's a minister. Then he says, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. Synergos, synergy, they're part of my team, my close team. Uh, they risk their own necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. So. There's an amazing interrelationship between Paul and Priscilla and Aquila. He then says, greet my beloved Eponetus, who is the first fruits of Achaia to Christ. Greet Mary, who labored much for us. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my countrymen and fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles, who also were in Christ Jesus before me. So these are people who he doesn't call fellow workers, but he loves them, he honors them, he respects them. They, some of them are fellow apostles or doing different things, but he greets them, he loves them. But then he says, greet Amplius, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ Jesus. And Stachys, my beloved. And he goes on to list names and teams. He says, greet, let me read you a couple of them. Apelles and those who are of the household of Aristobulus. Herodian, my countrymen, and those who are of the household of Narcissus, Tryphena and Tryphosa, who have labored in the Lord, my beloved Persis, who labored much in the Lord, Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine, Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermas, Patrobus, Hermes, the brethren who are with them, Philologus and Julia, Nereus and his sister and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. These are pictures of little teams, little families, but there is mutual respect, honor, love, and he greets them and he loves them. And he, he lifts them up and says, they're great people, they're doing great work. But he mentions by name those who are his fellow workers. I'm just going to read you a few passages about these fellow workers because at the end of today's talk, I want you to get excited to say, maybe I should be a part of a team of fellow workers. Maybe I can go deeper, further, closer to the Lord by joining a team of workers who are working for the Lord. So in Colossians <clears throat> chapter 4, he's going to mention five of his fellow workers. In verse 7, he says, Tychicus, a beloved brother, faithful minister, fellow servant in the Lord, will tell you all the news about me. I'm sending him to you for this very purpose, that he may know your circumstances and comfort your hearts. Paul is sending him. There's definitely a leader in these teams of fellow workers. And Paul has fellow workers. But we're going to see he doesn't lord it over them, but they do honor him and obey what he asks them to do. Verse 9, Onesimus, a faithful brother who is one of you, they will make known to you all the things which are happening here. Onesimus is an amazing person. In the book of Philemon, right at the end of the Bible, we see that Onesimus was a slave in Philemon's household. Paul calls Philemon one of his fellow workers. So Philemon was one of Paul's close team in Colossae, and Onesimus was his slave, but he deserted. He ran away and may have stolen some stuff. And Paul met him in Rome, and he became a Christian under Paul's ministry. And Paul then calls Onesimus one of his fellow workers here and in the book of Philemon he sends him back to Philemon's household so that they can be reconciled and he asks Philemon he says I could really ask you tell you to do this but I'm asking you please would you take Onesimus back and forgive him for running away from you so we can see the interplay there Onesimus so Tychicus Onesimus verse 10 Aristarchus my fellow prisoner greets you with Mark 
the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you have received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. Why does he say you've received instructions about Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, if he comes to you, welcome him? Why does he say that? Because in Acts chapter 15, we see that Mark deserted Paul and Barnabas. Acts 15. Now, Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark, but Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. Then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. And so we see that here in Colossians 4, Paul calls Mark one of his fellow workers and he says, you've received instructions about him. In other words, they were reconciled later, but earlier on, Mark had failed in the task and Paul had fired him from his team, but Barnabas had taken him on. So we can see the Bible is very real and it shows us how these relationships worked out in real life. So Tychicus, Onesimus, Aristarchus, Mark, he says, you've received instructions, welcome him. I, I accept him. He's one of my fellow workers again. And Jesus, who is called Justice, these are my only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are of the circumcision. They have proved to be a comfort to me. He lists them by name and he says, these are the ones that are my fellow workers. Why would he say that? Because he wants the people to receive them as if they were receiving poor. He says, they listen to me, they speak the same language as me, they share the anointing and the grace with me, and they bring you something from me, welcome them, and we are a team together. Listed by name, he says, also, they are a comfort to me. It's not a team that is just um, administrative or, or task oriented. there is a relationship, there is comfort. And I just want to show you one more example. And that's the example of Apollos um, and Paul. So in the church in Corinth, there were some people who followed Paul and some people who followed Apollos. These two were both apostles. Uh, we can see from 1 Corinthians 4 that Paul talks of Apollos as another apostle. He says, God has put us apostles and he's talking about him and Apollos. But some people followed Apollos and some people followed Paul. They were not in the same team. Paul had his own team of workers and Apollos had his own, but Paul respected Apollos and loved him and called him a brother. And in 1 Corinthians 3, he tells them to stop separating into two camps between Apollos and Paul. Paul would never insist that people saw him as an apostle. In 1 Corinthians 9, he says, I am a, an apostle to you, but I'm not to everybody. He would let them choose, but he did say, we mustn't have factions where we say they're bad because they follow a different team leader. So listen to what it says. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 3. For you are still carnal. For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you believed, as the Lord gave to each one? I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. He says, me and Apollos are God's fellow workers. I have my own fellow workers, and I've listed Tychicus, Aristarchus, all these different names. But Apollos and I are in different teams, but we are all God's fellow workers. He's the boss of our team of synergists, and we respect and love him and don't say, I'm of this team, so I'm not going to follow that person. Isn't that amazing? In 1 Corinthians 16, he tells them about Timothy, who's part of his team, and then he tells them about Apollos. He says, If Timothy comes, see that he may be with you without fear, for he does the work of the Lord as I also do. He says he's representing me. Therefore, let no one despise him, but send him on his journey in peace, that he may come to me, for I'm waiting for him with the brethren. 
So he says, Timothy is one of my guys, receive him. But then he mentions Apollos. Remember a few chapters earlier, he said, don't have factions where you favor one or the other. But he says, now concerning our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to come to you with the brethren, but he was quite unwilling to come at this time. However, he will come when he has a convenient time. You see, Apollos doesn't follow Paul's instructions. Apollos is his own man, his own leader, and Paul loves and respects him, but he's making it clear. There's Apollos' team, there's my team, and there is a way of working within the body of Christ. And then he says in verse 16, Submit to such and to everyone who works and labors with us, to our fellow workers, to our synergists. So what do we do with all of this? How do we put all of this into practice? I've got a few points. The first is the synergy that comes in a team is important and we need it. You can see that Paul had a team of people who he trusted, who he respected, who he would send to do things and they followed his instructions. They comforted one another. There was a goodwill and good relationships between them. And Paul told people who his list of people were and that they should follow them. We need that synergy. How do I find it and, and what kind of a team should I be in? Can I just suggest that whatever your gift is, there is a place for you in a team. You may say, I'm not a great public speaker. I'm not a miracle worker. I'm not a whatever, whatever you think the, the main ministries are. We need, in every team, you need administrative people who can organize. You need servants who will help do a whole lot of work. You need people who will give money. Paul, when he calls the Philippians his partners, it was mainly because they contributed money to him. And he says, because you've given, my God will supply your needs. So we need givers. We need those who will pray. We need those who will do publicity. Uh, we need the public speakers. We need all the different levels. And a team of people is just a, a, a unique organ within the body that God has put together to achieve a certain task. So that's the first point, is we need to find a team and get that synergy going. The second very important point, which I've already mentioned from these verses, is that we shouldn't be exclusive and say, our team is the only team that matters. We should be part of a bigger church where we respect each other, we love each other, we honor each other. And yet within that, there are teams that work. And then the third very, very important point is that teams are messy. <laughs> teams are messy. They, they can have broken relationships. I've already mentioned to you Mark and Onesimus. So Mark was in Paul's team. He failed to do what Paul had asked him to do. Paul said, no, you're no longer in my team. But then years later, they were restored and reconciled. And actually, Mark wrote the gospel of Mark in the Bible. So Mark was restored to teams, but teams are messy. Onesimus was a slave who'd run away from his master. He became a fellow worker, a synergos of Paul's, and then Paul tried to reconcile Philemon and Onesimus. What about Demas? In Philemon 1 verse 23, Paul writes, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you, as do Mark Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow laborers, my synergists. There was a man called Demas, D-E-M-A-S, who was one of Paul's fellow workers, and he honored him, and he told people, he is one of my fellow workers. But in 2 Timothy 4, a few years later, verse 10, Paul writes, For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica. We can see that these teams are messy and difficult. And just because there is conflict and stress and struggle, that doesn't mean it's not of God. It doesn't mean it's a bad thing to have teams. We need to learn to work through these problems. And the last one I want to show you, the last problem person that I want to show you or, or relationship in these teams, because it, it kind of sums the whole thing up, is in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 2. Paul is writing to the Philippians and he says, I implore Euodia and I implore, implore 
syntike, to be of the same mind in the Lord. So there were these two ladies, Euodia and Syntyche, and Paul says, I'm imploring with them. He's writing this letter to the church, but he speaks to them by name. He says, Euodia and Syntyche, I'm imploring you to get right with each other. Be of the same mind. Be friends again, because they had, had fallen out with each other. And then in verse 3, he says, And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers, synergos, whose names are in the book of life. He says, and I also urge you, true companion. Now, this is the word that actually means yoke fellow, true companion. In some versions of the Bible, and if you look at the Greek, it means yoke fellow, somebody who's yoked with me. He's writing to a particular person. He doesn't name him. Many think it's Luke. Some people say it's other people. But he calls him yoke fellow. He says, my other fellow worker who's yoked with me, I urge you to help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also. Get Clement, get Euodia, get Syntyche, get them together, help them with the rest of my fellow workers, my synergos, whose names are in the book of life. Get them together and help them please to be reconciled. And I want to close our, our series of talks on being a part of God's body by talking about being reconciled. You know, in Matthew 18, Jesus said, the things that cause offense will come. There will be problems, broken relationships, misunderstandings. People will let you down. And it's well within the rights of the leader of a team of fellow workers to say, you can't be part of our team anymore because you just are not reliable. But there is always the need for restoration. Paul made up with Mark and brought him back into the fold. Euodia and Syntyche, he says, I'm imploring you to be of one mind. I'm even asking my yoke fellow, my true companion and Clement to try and get you together again. And further on in Matthew 18, Jesus gives instructions on how we're supposed to resolve these issues. He says, if your brother sins against you, so there's got to be a sin. Whenever there's a break of relationship, we've got to identify what is the sin. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. The first step is to go one-on-one, -on -one, not to talk to somebody else, not to start a a, a social media chat, not to gossip, not to ask for prayer from other people in a way to try and gather support for your side. Go to them alone and speak to them with humility, with love. Say, I feel like this has happened. I feel like there's this sin and this problem. Maybe I've sinned as well and you work it through. If they hear you, you've gained your brother. If he will not hear, take with you one or two more and by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be, be established. He says, take loyal yoke fellow, um, the, the true companion, take Clement, get some others together. Let's try and get this together. And eventually, if you can't do it, uh, take it to the church. If he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen or a tax collector. There is a place in the body of Christ, just like Paul did with Mark. He said, I'm sorry, there's no repentance. We've tried to work this through. We have to back off and take some space and maybe we can try and restore again later. But it's better for there to be a clean break than for there to, to be an ongoing conflict in a team. Now, this may have surprised you. You might have thought of church on one level and to see that there's this level of detail and conflict and working together and how Paul trusts people to represent him and, and the, he lists the names of his work members, his, his fellow workers. This may have surprised you today, but I want to say to you, this is Bible and this is what we should be working towards. Find a team of people, find a team leader. Often it's a person with an apostolic gift. And then within a, a team of, of an apostolic leader, there are often smaller teams to do different tasks. And that is the way God has designed church to be. Find your team. We at Leading Lights are here to help you do something where you live. We originally have come up with this idea for countries and parts of the world where churches are illegal or they are hard to find to enable and equip people to start churches in their homes. 
but it may be that you're in a country where there are lots of churches. Get into a church and use our resources to help you or start a church. It's not a bad thing to start a church as long as you start with the right motives of wanting to spread God's gospel and you do it with good relationships, being honest with everyone around you. We will help you build teams. Let's spread the gospel. You know, when we get the church to be like the New Testament church, we will see the results that they saw, where they turned the world upside down in a very short time. Lord, I pray for my friend who's watching that you would help them to become part of a team of other Christians, but also, Lord, to be active in spreading your word and to be effecting the Great Commission all over the planet as you've commanded us to do. I pray, Lord, that you would stir us to do more, not to just be passive spectators, but to be active participants in what you're doing. And I pray your anointing and your blessing on what they're doing right now. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. For you are children of the light. Shine like stars in the dark world. You are the light of the world, like a city on a mountain, glowing in the night for all to see. Carry the light-giving message into the night. This is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the nations, to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Those who are wise will shine as bright as the sky, and those who turn many to righteousness will shine like stars forever. Leading Lights Network is here to help you grow as a disciple of Jesus and to help others become growing disciples. We have Bible school courses, weekly featured videos, testimonies from church leaders, and much, much more. We are also available to form relationships with you as you develop in God's plan and calling for your life. Visit leadinglightsnetwork.com, link with us on social media, or download the Leading Lights app from any app store.